Okay. Uh, last time we were talking about um, cusp forms, let's say on the modular surface, SL2Z uh, of weight K. Um, so remember, these are holomorphic functions. F is uh, holomorphic and uh, has a transformation law, ABCD, uh, acting on Z is equal to um, CZ plus D to the K comes out this uh, co-cycle F of Z. Okay, and uh, being a cusp form meant that when we integrate over X plus I, Y, uh, E to the minus zero X, in other words, the zeroth Fourier coefficient. So the other thing about being a cusp form, it has translation by one, so it has a Fourier expansion. F of Z is a sum over uh, N greater than, let's start with zero, uh, Q to the N, where Q is E to the two pi I Z. This is the chart at infinity. Uh, this integral, of course, picks off the zero Fourier coefficient. Well, times, uh, yeah, actually it's, actually it's just that because uh, it's times zero, times one, times E to the zero. Um, and being a cusp form is exactly that this uh, vanishes. This is also the limit of F. This is also uh, uh, limit of F of F as Y goes to infinity is, well, if it's a cusp form, then it's, then it's uh, zero. All right. Um, so in other words, this starts at one. And uh, in the process of studying L functions attached to this thing, we recorded the, uh, we showed, again, Hecke wouldn't like that this is called the trivial bound, the Hecke bound, which is that these coefficients, um, as, they, as they come, not the normalized ones, although you could do this all in, in normalization, are bounded by n to the k over two. Okay, so getting an exponent, any exponent, any exponent less than k over two is called subconvex exponent. Now, where's convexity? Where's the fragment Lindelof law convexity principle? Of course, that's uh, uh, nomenclature left over from L functions where you use, uh, well, we didn't really talk about convexity of, of zeta, but this is something very classical that uh, you can read in a lot of places. So let's let's just zero in on, on this problem. This is a very well uh, studied problem with a long literature, long literature. And we're gonna skip straight to uh, the method, the method of Akshay Venkatesh, which sort of blew open uh, a whole industry of uh, applying uh, ergodic theory dynamical systems techniques to solving longstanding problems in particular. Uh, so he and, and Michel eventually managed to prove uh, subconvexity for subconvex for all GL2 L functions over number fields. Something that using classical techniques uh, Klosterman sums and this kind of thing, uh, Kuznetsov formulas uh, was very much out of reach and probably still is today to do this, to do sort of general GL2 L function subconvexity over number fields. But the method, so for, to do that, you need to uh, work adelically and uh, do a whole lot of very uh, technical stuff. Um, but just for this very simple problem, it really illustrates the whole the whole method, as Akshay himself uh, points out. So, so that's what I'd like to uh, to show you his his method for this subconvexity problem. Now, I'm going to use two black boxes. So, Can I ask quickly? Please. So, this would apply to like MOS forms in particular, right? Exactly. It would apply to MOS forms in exactly the same way as it would to modular forms. Because for modular for the holomorphic forms, you have Deline, right? That's exactly right. Well, so uh, Deline, of course, gives us, so let's say, let's put this here. Deline gives us, instead of k over 2, k over 2 minus a half. 
what we're going to do, where we're going to get is k over two minus some tiny little epsilon. Okay. And the other thing was, um, so like, what's the, what role does the group play here? The group gamma. Yeah. Um, you will see. Okay. We'll see. It, it plays. It plays a rather subtle role. Well, like it's in these two for, black boxes. Not just for SL two Z or something. Yeah, this has nothing to do with SL two Z. This this is anything okay. that has a parabolic, so that I can make a Fourier expansion with a Q series. Okay. All right. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yep. We're not using arithmeticity at all. I'm just keeping it to SL two Z, so I don't have to say something more general than needs to be said for the for us to see the uh, the method. But okay. yeah, this has nothing to do with SL2Z um, or, or any okay. uh, gamma containing uh, a parabolic element, a non-trivial parabolic. OK, great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, lattice, finite volume. OK. So this is all for, for lattices. You have to do something else if you want to work on, on non-lattices, Okay. on thin groups. OK, so black box one is uh, equidistribution of low-lying horocycles. This is something we've discussed on several occasions, but I'm, I'm not sure we ever uh, wrote it down. So if you have a function f, which is, let's say, an L2 of h mod gamma and maybe also smooth, c infinity, and um, and I want not just uh, not just the fact that it equidistributes, but effective equidistribution. Effective meaning with error terms, with with rates. Effective equidistribution. Effective equidistribution of low-lying horocycles. So what's a low-lying horocycle? I have my my favorite fundamental domain. I have a horocycle, which is just this horizontal translation, and and it's closed. Equidistribution of low-lying closed horocycles. Although it doesn't have to be closed. You can take pieces of horocycles and. Uh, move them down. But just for simplicity, let's keep it to that. So low lying means I'm going to apply. So if I'm thinking of this as my tangent vector, and I've moved it by uh, nx, nx is, is this uh, favorite element, translation by x, um, and, uh, and I apply a y to it with small y. So this is, yeah, so, so that's going to be my question for you in a second. Uh, what, what is this, this region? So I can write it like this, f of x plus i, y, an integral from zero to one dx. So that's sort of capturing this integral, but of course, f is automorphic. I've assumed f is invariant under gamma. This is where uh, the role of gamma, Lewis, is gonna be hidden in the statements of these theorems, which will certainly be false if, uh, if you don't have um, you know, a nice lattice uh, undergirding everything. Okay, yeah. So, uh, so what's going to happen to this integral? Well, of course, it's the same as the integral of f over the image of this horocycle. And where is the image of this horocycle? So I claim that that's getting equidistributed. That's the equidistribution of low-lying closed horocycles is that this is equal to uh, the total integral of f over h mod gamma, you know, d dx dy over y squared, uh, normalized by the volume. If I set f to be the constant function one, I had better get one on both sides. Uh, if, if you like put this normalization into your Haar measure, uh, but I like to think of it like this, plus an error term. So here's the effectivity, an error term that depends on, of course, it has to depend on f. If I multiply f by a thousand, this uh, constant had better scale by, by a thousand. And uh, something, so this is as y goes to infinity, um, or to zero, right? I'm sorry, thank you, to zero, exactly. Uh, I get some positive power of, of y. In other words, this is going to zero. So uh, the equidistribution of low-lying horocycle says there exists a constant eta so that if f is smooth, then uh, as well, and automorphic, then as y goes to zero, the integral over this low-lying horocycle, you see the y here, that's the the low-lying horocycle, is uh, the total mass of f. In other words, that horocycle has become equidistributed, and we have an effective rate. Um, let's pretend for the purposes of this discussion that the big O dependence is really big O of 
the L2 norm of F times Y to the eta. It's really something like a Sobolev norm. Uh, so this is pretend. Just for, for the purposes of our discussion, it's really something like a Sobolev norm. In other words, L2 Sobolev, not love, Sobolev norm, which is just the L2 integral, not just of F, but its derivatives. And we could use Lie theory to explain uh, what, what that means, but let, let's just pretend that it's uh, L2 just for simplicity. Okay, so the way that it depends on F is on the L2 norm of F. You increase F by, by some constant, then this also increases by that, that same constant. So at least in that sense, we're uh, uh, stable, consistent. Okay, I wanna lift this in two ways. One is to first write this as a, uh, as uh, using group elements, you know, using a y, which is uh, root y zero zero one over root y, and n x. So actually, this is an integral. This is easy to see. This is an integral of n x a y dx, since that's exactly. Uh, so this is under the identification. I guess let me put the i here. So that now there's no problem about identification. This is literally. Uh, the element x plus i y. These two things are the same. And um, now let me do a couple of things. In fact, uh, I don't need to work in the upper half plane. In fact, it'll be more convenient for me not to work in the upper half plane. Um, also true for f in L2 not just of, remember the upper half plane is G mod K. So these are like K invariant. So the upper half plane can be identified with G mod K. K is SO2. So these are the G and these are the K invariant functions on G, but actually there's no, uh, K invariance does nothing for this. Uh, actually I can work in all of G mod gamma. You can think of that as working in the unit tangent bundle and the tangent vector, unit tangent vector is also become equidistributed. And let's take it to be smooth. Because I'll because in reality I have some integrals, some derivatives here. This Sobolev norm is going to need some derivatives. So let's just say I have them all. Also true for f in as a function of g, the statement is the same. It's that the integral from zero to one, f of nx a y, now just an element of the group, dx, if f is gamma invariant, is equal to the integral over g mod gamma f dg. This is Haar measure on the group. Uh, normalized by the, the volume, the co-volume of gamma, uh, plus again, big O, let's pretend it's the L2 norm of Y to the eta for some Y. Okay, so far so good. And let me make one more little modification. I guess maybe I boxed it a little too early. One more little modification which is that this isn't really the length. It looks like this has length one, but as we know, lengths uh, contract as you get closer down and expand, I mean, the Euclidean length. So um, you remember the uh, Ramanian structure. So, so actually it's better to reverse orders here. So if I look at N, X, A, Y, what is that as, a, as the group elements? I have this product one over root y, which is, uh, so they're both upper triangular. So I get this on the diagonals and the, and the lower. And what about here? I get a zero and an x over root y, x over root y. Well, that's the same because this uh, n normalizes a, that's the same if I reverse orders, that's the same as a y times n something. So let's multiply that out. That's a y, which is root y zero zero one over root y, times n something. And of course, I'll get this upper triangular thing. And what do I get on the question mark? I get root y times the question mark. Root y times the question mark needs to be x over root y. So I better have here an x. Um, can I do the algebra? Question mark times root y is equal to x over root y. So I get an x over y.
Okay, so let me um, let me write that in here that this is equal to the integral from zero to one, f of a y n x over y dx, and that is actually more closely aligned with what's going on. I guess I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make one more change of variables. Yeah, this is not a very x a very good presentation. Um, let's move that over there. This is a little uh, computational aside. Okay, I'm gonna make one more little modification to this, and I think then I'm done, which is to make a change of variables, x goes to, uh, x goes to um, y times x. In other words, let's call it t, since you guys don't like it when I do this. Let's call it t, is equal to x over y. No, it's okay. All right. It's just Andre. It's just Andre. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Fine. Well, uh, I'll it's make it this. He, so this is. It's because he spends so much time working on the computer. Yeah. <laughs> and the computer would get angry. Got it. Um, so, so I'll make x over y equal to t. The integral when x is equal to 1 t is equal to one over y. Remember, y is small. So one over y is long. That's what I mean by this is a long Hora cycle. And dx, uh, dx is dt uh, times y. Uh, so I'll write this as dt divided by one over y. Why would I write it like this? Well, the length of this integral is one over y. So I want to normalize by the length. So this is the normalized. This is a probability measure. And this is a probability measure. And in the limit as y goes to 0, this probability measure converges to that probability measure. So this is the form that I would like to uh, hold on to as a black box. So far, so good? Oh, and one over y came from the change of variables, right? So one over y came for the change of variables. Yes. So you don't fact, need to you don't need to adjust your error term. I do not need to adjust my error term. Exactly. Okay. This is just yep. an exact equality. Uh huh. All right. And the point I want to make, if if uh, is that really this thing has length one over y, which is very long. So there's two ways of thinking about what's happened here. One way, let, let's look at let's look at this point of view versus this point of view. So the first point of view. What, what has happened? I started with i up. And remember, uh, the, the, um, the action is by right multiplication. We have, we're using the right regular representation, the right regular representation uh, gives us our, our action, is, corresponds to the geometric action, corresponds, corresponds to the geometric action. So I'm, so I'm going to read this um, left to right. So nx means I move over as x goes from 0 to 1, over here to 1. That's what nx did. And then ay lowered this whole integral. And then ay pushed this whole thing down. So this is nx ay. OK? The alternate point of view is right here. You start with or, so that's this is view one, view one. View two is, again, I start with I up, my, my base point. I first flow by A y down to this low height. And then I walk N t, and then I walk along the Hora cycle. But the distance that I have to walk is really 1 over y. So I walk a long distance. And when I walk a distance 1 over y, at height y, Euclidean height y, that's a Euclidean length of 1. So that's these two points of view. If I take something that's really hyperbolic length 1, and I push it down, push all of it down, I get something of length 1 over y. or I start with this point, I push it down to height 1 over y, then I have to walk genuinely a distance of 1 over y uh, in order to get to the Euclidean point 1. Does this make sense? 
Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So that's black box one. Nick, something you don't like? Nope, I'm good. Okay. That's black box one. Let me make the remark. So uh, this was first observed by Don Zagier. Zagier in around 1980 is that uh, four gamma equals SL2Z, four gamma equals SL2Z. We actually know what, what value of eta there is. Eta is uh, a half. So the, the, ro the, the rate of equidistribution is one half. And um, it's equal to three quarters uh, minus epsilon for any epsilon, if and only if the Riemann hypothesis is true. So if you would like an attack on the Riemann hypothesis, you could try to show a uh, faster growth rate. I mean, I don't think this is a real attack, but uh, yeah. And then I should mention that for general gamma, uh, in general, for general such gamma, for general um, non-co-compact lattices, non-co-compact lattices, gamma, this is due to Sarnet. This equidistribution, Effective vector distribution is due to Sarnak in AD immediately after Zagi. So if you if you put a different L function there, are you talking about a different group or something? If I put a different L function instead of RH, if you're talking about oh, like or... uh, yeah, well, so the reason RH comes up is because the Eisenstein series, the constant term of the Eisenstein series, which is what uh, this integral is capturing uh -huh. C zeta. Okay. And so uh -huh. depending on how far you can pull a contour, depending on whether RH is true or not, depending on how far you can pull a contour, you get a better uh, uh, rate of equidistribution. And okay. so for different groups, you'll get different. Uh, yeah, you can try to do similar things and recast. In fact, people, yeah. Okay, so then we're getting into the prime number theorem for general L functions. Uh, using Eisenstein series, using constant terms of Eisenstein series. There's a, there's a long letter of Sarnax about this. Uh, yeah, okay. it's a great question. Yeah, cool. Okay, so that's black box one. I'm just going to keep this. Black box two. Black box two. Black box two. is the mixing of the Horus cycle flow. This is the title of black box two. The title of black box one is effective extrusion of low-line closed Horus cycles. Okay, what's the mixing uh, of the Horus cycle flow? So let's say we have, so there exists an eta, I'm sure I'll need this kind of thing, so that for all functions, let's say F1 and F2, that again are square integrable on G mod gamma and let's say smooth. So um, if I write T F of G, what I mean is, uh, so T will be my uh, step length one step of the horror cycle flow. So this is F of G times n1. In other words, wherever g was, I'm going to, so I'm going to evaluate f wherever g was. This was g. I'm going to take, uh, remember the, the horror cycle flow. So this is the geodesic flow. The horror cycle flow moves orthogonally to it. I'm going to take a step of length one along it and evaluate f there. So this is the, again, right translation. This is the right regular representation, right regular representation, which is uh, translation Core cyclic translation by one. Okay. And I claim that this transformation acting on uh, my favorite test vectors, F1 and F2, uh, will be uh, mixing, exponentially mixing, uh, effective. So effective mixing, I should add the word effective, effective mixing of the horror cycle flow. So what does that mean? If I take the uh, matrix coefficient, so this is called a matrix coefficient.
Why a matrix coefficient? Any guesses why this resembles a matrix coefficient? I mean, if you think of T as a matrix, I mean, this is a transformation, right? It's doing something to functions. So if you think of it as a matrix, if I take F to be like, you know, a coordinate vector and F2 to also be a coordinate vector, then this will give me the I G, this is the ith coordinate vector and the jth coordinate vector. It'll give me the ij element of T. So that's why this, this uh, became known as matrix coefficients. So what does this mean? This literally means I integrate, what is the inner product? The inner product is this L2 inner product. So I integrate over G mod gamma, TF, um, TF1 of G, F2 of G bar, DG. Okay, so it's just this, this inner product. And, and we know what this means. It means I take this G and I stick an N1 into it. Well, for a single uh, instance of T, I really don't know what's going on. But if I apply T many times, if I apply T J times, and of course applying T J times is the same thing as translating, not by uh, step one, but by J steps, these two functions will become um, asymptotically independent. So what does it mean if two, if you have, uh, so this is, the, this is mixing. Mixing is that, uh, what, what's a uh, what's an event in probability theory? It's just a function. And two events are independent if their inner product is the same, if, if their correlation is the same as just, if the probability of both of them happening is just uh, the probability of one happening times the probability of the other happening, right? So this is, mixing is asymptotic independence of events. Asymptotic independence of events F I'm thinking of as, uh, as an event, F2 I'm thinking of as, as an event. And uh, as J goes to infinity, I wanna say that this converges to um, the inner product of F with the constant function one, the inner product of F2 with the constant function one. I have to normalize by the volume, by the volume of G mod gamma. So this is uh, as J goes to, so as, j goes to infinity, uh, these things become independent. So the probability of them both happening is just the product of the probabilities of them individually happening, normalized, plus an error, again, depending on some uh, Sobolev type norms of, of f1 and f2 of j to some power. Let's write this as uh, one, plus, one plus j. I mean, j will be uh, large, so, but I, but I can write it uniformly like this to some negative power. Okay, so these are two black boxes. They're, they're not entirely, um, they're very, very well known, but they're, uh, if, you, if you've never seen them before, they're not entirely immediate to swallow, but hopefully I've motivated them at least somewhat. Any questions on, on these? Does this make sense, what's going on? I think it sounds pretty good. Okay. You have some function F1, which is like, you know, if I'm thinking of both of these as indicators, so F1 is like an indicator function of this region. F2 is an indicator function of this region. And so what's the probability? If I just multiply F1 by F2, well, that's zero everywhere. They don't see each other at all. But if I start moving F1 by uh, this, time j horror cycle flow, f1 goes somewhere. And over time, the probability uh, of their intersection at large time j is just the product of whatever the probability was of f1 happening at all times whatever the probability was of f2 happening at all. That's this asymptotic, asymptotic uh, independence of events. And it's effective because I have a rate. So I need these power rates. These power rates will be crucial to getting, of course, I want a power savings uh, on the uh, Fourier coefficient. And um, 
Who is this shown by? Oh, this uh, this is very old. I mean, in some form, this goes back to how more. So how more, how more uh, show the decay of matrix coefficients. Matrix coefficients. And the ineffective form, um, I don't know who to quote here, Margulis. I mean, it basically comes from uh, the classification of uh, um, the unitary dual of SL2R in this case. But it, it, this is something very, uh, very classical. Uh huh. So it's like proven with like representation theory? That's one way of proving it. Yeah. That's okay. a very easy way of proving it. What you do is you project what, what you can do it by spectral theory too. You take your F1 and F2, you project onto the, the base eigenfunction, which is the constant function. And then what's happening in the rest of the spectrum, the spectrum that's orthogonal to uh, constant functions, is that these matrix coefficients decay. That's what this uh, decay is referring to. And, um, and that, it's, that it's effective is just a, a translation of uh, some simple representation theory about, about this model. Okay, yeah, thanks. So, so this is gonna be my second black box. All right, with these so, two black boxes, we can give uh, Akshay's proof. So is there something about like how the representations are kind of like, I mean, it's, it's just something I'm not as familiar with, but they're kind of, um, I don't know, like discretized or kind of spaced or something like that in a certain yeah, sense? Yeah, so I've given a discrete version of this. This has nothing to do with the fact that it's horror cycle flow or that it's discrete. Uh, if you take right. any, uh, the truth is if you take any uh, group element G and you, uh -huh. uh, and you move F1 by G, so you take the matrix coefficient of G, uh -huh. uh, then as long as G is going to infinity, uh, uh -huh. escaping any compact set in this quotient, uh -huh. uh, not in this quotient, in G itself, uh, since uh -huh. we're multiplying on the right, this has nothing to do with gamma invariance on the left. Right. The uh -huh. translation is happening on the right. As long as G is going uh, to, to infinity, you get mixing. And uh, in order to explain the rate, I have to say, you know, what, what does it mean for G to be going to infinity? Like, how big is it really getting? So I guess what I was thinking is like, you know, sort of like an analog to like, you know, just in Poisson summation, you look at the zero frequency and then you yes. know, want to show that the rest are small. Exactly. But usually like implicitly you're kind of using the fact that like one is far away from zero. Yeah, so this is like, yeah. So this eta will very strongly depend on the spectral decomposition of G mod gamma. If there like are the uh, eigen small value eigenvalues value. close to one, okay. that will make eta worse, smaller. I see, okay, okay. So in exactly the same way as this is, this is you could call this Poisson summation. Uh-huh. Or a type, some type of Poisson summation. Yeah, so but it's, it's like not, doesn't eta have anything to do with like, Eta is like the spectral gap or something. It is very closely related to the spectral gap. Yes, depends okay. on spectral gap. Depends on spectral gap. In both settings, by the way. Uh, up here, eta also depends on the spectral gap. It's just that we know what the spectrum is for SL2Z. There are no eigenvalues in zero to a quarter. Uh huh. And okay. So then you can go even farther into, um, into eta. All right. Thanks. Yep. Okay. So let's get into it. Um, I have my, my modular form, my, my uh, cusp form. This is an SK. If I take the integral from zero to one, F of X plus I, Y, E of minus N X DX, I will pick off as we did last time, the nth Fourier coefficient times E to the minus two pi N Y. And uh, we don't like that this has, this is suggesting that this has uh, exponential uh, growth. So we're gonna choose, we're gonna set y, uh, set y to be one over n. Then uh, here I get i over n. And here I get just e to the two pi, just some constant. Okay. Now I, I need to ma manipulate this a little bit into functions that are on, uh, G and that are automorphic. So I need to make, need to make 
need to make an automorphic function 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 on G out of F. This is very simple to do. Let's call it F tilde. If I am given some element in G, this is uh, in G, a, some ABCD, I'll, I'll say uh, you take F of ABCD acting on I, but this won't be gamma automorphic. If I apply by, if I'm, if I act by gamma on the left, I'm not going to uh, get something automorphic. I'm going to kick out a C I plus D to the kth power. So I'm going to multiply by C I plus D to the minus kth power. That's just the definition. I've given you, for any element of G, I've given you a uh, complex number. Okay. K is an integer. I don't need a, a, it's a complex number raised to, you know, a, an integer power. And so there's, there's no question of branch with, cuts. Sorry. You don't do anything with like SO2, like it doesn't depend on it. Well, this uh, in a sense is the SO2. It's the K type. It's the, uh, the SO2 type uh, of this. Um, if we, if we took the full discrete series representation that this F generates. But uh -huh. I'm trying to avoid that representation theoretic language. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll just say uh, this is the some k isotypic component. Isotypic component. I'm just going to say words. Of, I mean, yeah, it, it doesn't even make sense to me anyway. So, <laughs> okay. I just wanted to make sure that because because f little f doesn't really see k, right? That's right. And well, it it, it says it doesn't see k. But actually, it does CK because it has this C, uh, CZ plus D to the K coming out. That is, in a sense, a, a way of seeing K. I think, I think I'll show a hint of that a little bit later. OK. All right. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, I mean, in a sense, you're right. When I multiply on the right by K, this doesn't change at all. Uh, but, this, uh, but this will. This will see the K. And in fact, the way that it'll change under K is exactly by a E to the 2 pi I uh, K. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So, so this function, uh, F tilde F was uh, differentiable. Everything is nice and, and smooth here. So this is still in C infinity and in L2 of G mod gamma. All right. Um, so if I want to go from, uh, from this expression back to F tilde, uh, it's the F of X plus I, uh, over N is n x a y acting on i that has the same value as f tilde of uh, it's not a y it's a um, one over n right i'm just reading this that's the same as f tilde of n x a one over n times um, CZ plus D, CI plus D to the K, CI plus D to the K. Now, what is CI plus D? So in this matrix, oh, we already worked out this matrix. It's, um, it's well, I have to work it out again. Uh, one over, so this is one over root N, zero, zero, one over uh, root N. Okay, so the point is actually, all I care about is the C and D entry. The C is zero, then the D is root N. So I get C uh, zero I plus root N to the K over two. Did you follow that? In other words, all I did was uh, I, just, I just put this C I plus D to the K to the other side with a positive K, but C is zero and D in this matrix, in this matrix, C is zero and D is root N. So I get N to the root N to the K, N to the K over two, yeah, so which is the why trivial Why is it value. A one over N? Why is A one over N? Because the height, we chose Y to be- Oh, 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 we're doing that. Okay, I see. In order to isolate the N Fourier coefficient. I mentioned this last time. 
when we were uh, proving the trivial bound, I said, yeah, the way to, to see this is to take a low lying horror cycle yeah. to get the syndrome. Right. Now we're going to exploit the fact that it's a low lying horror cycle and that these equities distribute. But by that by itself, just black box one does not give you um, subconvexity. You need black box one played against black box two. Okay, so far so good. Yeah, so we're just calculating like f of nx a y in terms of f tilde, right? Exactly. I want okay. to turn exactly. That, that's all I'm doing. So let me rewrite that here. So what we have is that a f of n is equal to some constant e to the two pi that I'm moving to the other side, and then this integral from oh let me do one more thing. Let me do one more thing. Remember. Uh, so there's this constant n to the k over two. Um, remember that we can interchange orders. Uh, this is f tilde of um, a one over n and n of nx. Same calculation as we did before to, to uh, interchange the a and the n they can be interchanged but at the cost of instead of instead of traveling time one we actually have to travel time n at this at this height one over n right you remember this yeah that's good okay so now i have an n to the k over two i'm just putting that in in here putting everything back into here um f tilde integral from zero to one f tilde of a one over n, n of, of the n. Okay, hopefully there's no, you guys can tell the difference between the n, which is the n Fourier coefficient, and the n, which is the matrix, the exponent of the nilpotent matrix, the unipotent matrix, n, right? That's not gonna scare anybody. I'll try to be clear about this. Um, so that's this with our, with our constant factor, and then e to the minus n x, dx. Yeah, I think it looks good. OK, what we argued last time, Hecke, uh, uh, the Hecke argument, is just to say that this thing is automorphic, and f decays exponentially at, uh, at the boundary. So um, recall, Hecke argues that f tilde is actually bounded for all values. And so there we recover our n to the k over two. So this recovers that the a f of n is bounded by n to the k over two, the trivial bound. And we wanna of course improve on that. Again, let me make a change of variables. t is equal to nx. So that this is e to the two pi, the same, uh, n. Now this is an integral of length. Well, let, let me put that in, in just a second. A one over n, n sub t. Yeah, that's, that's better. That gets us away from n, n sub n x, although I still have a one over n, whatever. E of minus two pi i t dx is dt over n. And we start at zero. And when x is equal to one, t is equal to n. So now this really gives us the impression that we, we are traveling along a distance n, normalized. And uh, this is what we're uh, evaluating. Let me draw a little picture here. So we're at height one over n. Well, I'm going from zero to n, doesn't matter, zero to n or zero or, uh, or uh, minus a half a half, same thing. Okay, so far so good. So this is our this is our integral of this automorphic function. Uh, we're picking off uh, its I guess. Well, I mean, it looks like it's its first Fourier coefficient. Of course, it's really its nth Fourier coefficient. We made a change of variables. Um, so far, so good. Good for me. Okay. Well, something subtle has happened. I just said this is like the first Fourier coefficient. This is independent under t goes to t plus one, invariant under t is replaced by t plus one. What that means here is if I integrate from zero to n, or I integrate from one to n plus one, 
or from, well, that, that total length of the integral is, uh, is the same, of course, doesn't matter, I'm integrating over some period, but actually on, on each of these uh, length one over n bits, this function isn't changing, only this function is. And wouldn't it be nice if uh, the fact that this function isn't changing, but this function is, if they had some asymptotic independence of one another. Nick, you wanted to say something. Oh, no, it just reminds me of black box two. It, it uh, uh, two or one. Uh, well, it, it, it's, it's sort of supposed to remind you of both. That's, that's the key idea. Okay. So, um, so now we're going to take a trick from uh, amplification. Amplification or uh, uh, Van der Varden, uh, Van der Korpet, Van der Korpet trick. Which is if you have one thing that's invariant and something that isn't, it's not a bad idea to average over the thing that's uh, th this invariance. So I'll make a, a new parameter k. So k is some parameter to be chosen later, to be chosen. And I say, this thing is the same as um, e to the two pi n to the k over two, one over n integral from zero to n. But if I translate t by t plus one, uh, nothing happens to this part, which means I can translate by length one f tilde of a one over n and t e to the minus t without changing anything. In other words, if so I- You're translating, translating f tilde? I'm translating f tilde. This is the same thing. This is the same thing as f tilde of a one over n and t plus one. So that changes f tilde. It's like I'm changing t to t plus one, but this doesn't, feel the effect of that. So basically what you would do is then just like do a variable change, t goes to t plus one and- I'll do it a bunch of times. And the, the e will eat it, right? The e will eat all of them. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. I'll do, it, I'll do it not just once. If I can do it once, I can do it j times. And I'll, and I'll sum as j goes from one to capital K. Uh-huh. So this is the van der Korpet averaging. Uh-huh. Right, you have an interval. Van der Korpert says you shift that interval a bunch of times, and then take Cauchy Schwarz and try to get cancellation in the interval. So the the trick is really because under this transformation, you know that one of these things is changing and the other isn't, or something. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. This is changing. This is not. So that's why I can I can just put a t here without changing anything there. Do we need to divide by k or something? Uh, thank you very much. And of course, I have to divide by k. OK. Now, the only thing left to do is Cauchy Schwartz. So after Cauchy Schwartz, I have a f n squared is bounded by, I don't care about this constant. I have an n to the k. I have a n squared, k squared. Oh, these are different k's. This is little k. And this is capital K. Hopefully that doesn't bother you. Let me make it capital J. Let's, let's at least not overload that letter that many times. Because k is also the compact. I'm using little j, so I mean, yeah, that's better. Capital J. And one over capital J. Okay, so I have, I, I'm just squaring so far. So far, I'm just squaring. And then I'm going to Cushy Schwartz in this one over n. So um, you can take uh, integral from zero to n of e to the minus t norm squared dt and an integral from zero to n of a sum j goes from one to t, uh, t to the j f tilde of a one over n and t squared dt.
Yeah, some from one to J, I think. To right? J, thank you. So far, so good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, well, this is 1. So this integral is n. So that n and one of these n's is done. And um, let's look so at this thing. Now yeah. you just have to show that thing is like bounded, ideally, right? Well, so, so yeah, let's think about this. In fact, I, I wanted to make a remark back here. Um, or like a squared, I guess. I mean, because you just, you lost an n, so now you have a to k, a, sorry, n to k minus one over two. And you're going to square, so you return it. And then you're like, you can sort of see what you need to get exactly to get like a, you know, close to yeah. thing, right? Yeah. So be before Kashi Schwartz, I meant to make this, this remark here. If, so this is an integral of length n. If we get square root cancellation on this interval, square root cancellation, cancellation on the interval of length n is here, if I get root n, I get divided by n. So I would get a bound of n to the k minus one over two. I get the lean. Right? You, you see that? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this well suggests we can try to do something in that direction. Um, now, once we once we have positivity, there's no uh, there's no more getting cancellation there. But now we're going to try to do something. So, um, well, this whole thing is a function of g. So let's uh, let's call it capital F, capital F of g, b, um, a sum as j goes from one to t, t to the j, one to j, I don't know why I keep saying t, t to the j, f tilde of g, norm squared, or not norm, just absolute value squared. Okay, this is a nice function of g. It's gamma invariant. This is, uh, I guess it's no longer, it's almost smooth. It's smooth except when it's, uh, it's still differentiable. Well, away from zero. Anyway, it's it's certainly in L2 of G mod gamma. We can certainly apply. Uh, I'll write this, but I'm lying. Um, and what do we have here? So so if if I package this as big F, now what do we have? A F of A N, N squared is bounded by N to the K um, and uh, one over N. And I have this factor one over J squared, an integral from zero to N, this F at A one over N, N T DT. So black box one. Tells us about low lying horror cycles. Ineffective form. So let me just keep these things one over n, one over j squared. And instead of this integral, I can put, let's remember what black box one was. Um, yeah, so, so y is one over n. So this is an integral from zero to n, f of a one over n, n t dt, and a one over n. So including the one over n that's in front, I just get the, the Haar measure plus uh, some, some tiny power there. So let's, let me put that here. Um, so including the one over n, To that, I apply black box two, and I get the integral over g mod gamma of f of g, eg. I have some, some constant, one over volume, gamma mod g, plus big O, depending on something like the L2 norm or sub norm of f, 
um, of y to the eta. Y is one over n, so that's n to a minus eta. Oh, sorry, the one over n got got pulled into uh, got pulled into black box one. So far, so good. Uh huh. Now this f, the f is the original f tilde, but translated a bunch, averaged a whole bunch of times. So in fact, this error term is really big O depending only on little f of some power of j. Uh, because I actually have to take derivatives, it might be some slightly larger power. It's not just j squared. I don't care what it is, but it's some power of j times n to the minus eta, right? Big F depends on J. So I want something that, that doesn't depend on J. Of course, J is a parameter that I'm gonna choose. And J be, uh, what, like N to epsilon or something? Am exactly, J is gonna be some small power of, of N. Okay. J will eventually be n to some small power. Okay, let's see what this gives us. Um, so now I have a n to the k. I have uh, this constant I don't care about. Let's just uh, th throw away the constant. I have an integral over g mod gamma, big F. Big F is this, uh, I'll, I'll put the normalization here sum as j goes from one to t of t to the j f tilde of g squared dg plus an error uh, depending only on, on f itself of j to the a um, a minus two but I don't I don't care about the value of a so I'm gonna a does a can change from line to line so I'm not going to record that it's minus two and n to the k minus eta. So this is good. But this, I keep writing t here. Why do I keep writing t? I can't help myself. That's a j. But this, the trivial bound, the trivial bound on this is j squared divided by j squared. This still has size one, and I still have my n to the k. I can't, I can't get a non-trivial bound yet. So, so it's it trivial because each of those is bounded by one roughly? Yeah, the F tildes are all con are all bounded by a constant. Oh yeah, okay, yep. And there's J of them. The trivial bound here is one. So, so here the trivial bound is N to the K and gets me nowhere, F squared. So this is, this is still a hecka. Boy, Vandercorp didn't give us anything, did it? Well, it gave us a whole parameter. It gave us a whole parameter to play with. And of course, what we're gonna do now is open the square. Okay, so this, this we're happy with. I'll, I'm gonna leave this for a second. This is good. So let's work on this part. Um, all right, fine, I'll keep the N to the K around. So we're gonna open the square. I have an integral oh. over g mod gamma. So initially I thought we were gonna open the square before and then integrate on the inside. But what you did was you applied black box one. So you effectively changed the integral from the hor like integrating on a horror cycle to integrating on all with g mod gamma. Is that what you did basically? That, that's exactly right. Okay. These ideas, I mean, they're so simple uh, once you see them, but coming uh -huh. up with exactly this, you know, uh, order of operations. It, it's absolutely brilliant. I mean, yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so integrating, if you kept the integral on the horror cycle, that's just, it's just tricky to do or something. So if you like scroll up a little bit, yep. And you just, instead of where you set this F of G, if you just open that square and then reverse orders, I guess that's, I don't know. We just don't know what to do about that or what? So, um, it's not an effective use of the two black boxes. It will only get us our one black box. Right, right. I mean, that's not exactly true. No, um, you'll get the same thing. 
if you want to open it here or, or open it where I'm opening it and then apply, you, you'll get the same thing. Okay, but I guess the point is that the only way we know to compute these like averages over long horror cycles is to relate them to the simpler thing. I guess it's simpler to average over all of G minus gamma. Well, uh, I don't know if it's simpler, but uh, it certainly puts things in the framework of a matrix coefficient. Oh, okay. It allows you to apply this other one. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. All right. I mean, of course, I've set up the black boxes where they exactly where they need to be for the, for the proof. You know, the question is, how do you come up with this in the first place? But all right, we're almost there. So yeah, I'll open it's, this. It's good Sorry, stuff. No, I was just gonna say, yeah, it's it's very good stuff. Yeah. This, this is all actually. Uh, so J, I have a J going from one to big J. I have a J prime going from one to big J. And uh, so I'll, let me reverse orders, pull this integral here, integral over G mod gamma, uh, T to the J F tilde of G and T to the J prime F tilde of G well, bar DG. I've just opened things up. And now we look like black box two almost, right? We sort, we almost look like black box two. But we need to sort of put all the T's on one of them. Exactly. We just make a change of variables, right? All this is, is uh, G N J bar, uh, N J prime. So I make a change of variables. G goes to G N J uh, N minus J prime. In other words, uh, make a change of variables. G gets replaced by G N minus J prime. That takes the J prime off of here and puts it and puts it there. This whole thing is equal to an integral over G mod gamma, gamma, T J minus J prime F tilde of G times F tilde of G bar DG. Now we have a diagonal. Okay, so we have in, in uh, J going up to big J and J prime going up to big J, we have the diagonal. The diagonal when these two are equal, I just get the L2 norm. I'm not getting, getting get any cancellation there. So, so this whole thing is equal to, I'll keep it. You, you save J there, right? But there's a one over J squared. Yeah. And there's only J diagonal contribution. So there's a one over J squared, a sum over uh, J going from one to J and J prime equal to J of just the L2 norm of F tilde squared. That's all this is when they're equal. Plus, let's sum over D. So D is the distance from the diagonal plus a sum over D going from one to, uh, uh, what is this? J, I guess it's J, maybe J minus one or something. Um, doesn't really matter. And then as J goes from, uh, I guess J starts at D. So if this distance is D, J starts at D and goes up to capital J and J prime is equal to D minus J. In other words, D is the, uh, sorry, J minus J prime is D. So if I move the J prime, then it's J minus D. Is that right? Whatever it is, it doesn't actually matter. I mean, uh, if I'm off by, by a plus or minus one here or there, it's not gonna make any difference in the calculation. The point is D starts at one, goes up to J. And then I have exactly the matrix coefficient T to the D F tilde of G uh, F tilde of F tilde T to the D F tilde inner product F tilde. Okay, you buy that? Yeah, that's good. I'm gonna bound the length of this just by J itself. 
I'm going to be crude here and just put J. Okay. Hang on, that was a sum over which J prime? Over J, J going from J uh, going from one to the other, and J prime is determined by the values of J and D. Oh, and you're saying it doesn't depend on on J. Uh, it's as it's at worst J. No, no, but the inner thing doesn't depend on J, right? The inner thing uh, doesn't depend on J exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, really, I have absolute values here. I mean, once I once I take these. Uh, I'm just I'm just pulling out this this stupid constant J. Okay, so now we want like a power savings off of the D sum. Exactly. Okay. But what do we know from black box two? It's the uh, mixing of horror cycle flow. So mixing of the horror cycle flow. tells us that the inner product of TD F tilde with F tilde is equal to the inner product of F tilde with one times one inner product F tilde over the volume of G mod gamma plus big O depending on, on the F tildes, which only depends on F, there's no J here to worry about, of D to some, uh, you know, one plus D to some, uh, to some negative power. So far, so good. Uh huh. Okay. But what is what is the inner product of F tilde with one? The volume of F tilde or something? Yeah. So let's see. Here's a trick for, for working this out. Um, it, it's, it's not a, well, I don't know what to call this. Uh, it's, it's very obvious once you've seen it, but it, maybe it's not immediately obvious uh, before you see it. The trick is to think about um, the inner product of F tilde, not with one, but with the Eisenstein series. The Eisenstein series lifted to be a function on G. In other words, this is an integral over G mod gamma, F tilde of G, um, E of G I S D G. Why would I look at that? Because it has like a constant residue at one. Because it has a constant residue, exactly. The residue will, will give me the residue. So residue at S equals one, of this thing is a constant. So it's so you can think of it as one when I inter, when I take this inner product. Okay, so let's see what this is. Um, again, I can uh, expand out what the Eisenstein series is. So if I fix some fundamental domain for uh, G mod gamma, I have F tilde of G, a sum over gamma and gamma mod gamma infinity of imaginary part of gamma G I to the S E G. I unfold. I mean, it, that's the sense in which this is a trick. It's the unfolding trick. I unfold and what do I get? This is G mod gamma is fundamental domain for G mod gamma summed over all of these translates when I make a change of variables and reverse orders. Now there's no, before, when we got in trouble before, there was a stabilizer. Here there's no stabilizer. Let's stabilize it. G mod gamma infinity. Exactly. Of F tilde of G and imaginary part of G I to the S E G. Okay, so far so good. Now we can take, uh, Iwasawa coordinates for G. Let's compute this in Iwasawa coordinates. G is NAK. DG in these coordinates is DN. Um, so this is your, uh, 
if I have n x a y k theta, then d g is d x d y over y squared as always d theta. The gamma infinity acts on the left and only acts on the n component. So this is an integral over n mod n intersect gamma infinity. In other words, n mod gamma infinity. Gamma infinity is a subgroup of n. And then an integral over a, and then an integral over k. Um, F tilde n x a y k theta. The imaginary part uh, doesn't see k theta. The imaginary part also doesn't see nx. It doesn't see k theta because I multiply by i. k theta fixes i. It doesn't see nx because nx is horizontal translation. It's the imaginary part. So this is uh, y to the s. And then I have uh, dx dy over y squared d theta. So far, so good. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. So the theta is nothing, right? Well, let's work. But what is f tilde? Remember what f tilde is. Oh, oh, oh. yeah. OK. Uh -huh. f tilde is f of n x a y k theta acting on i. So I'm not even going to bother putting that. Times c z plus d to the uh, k or negative k. Uh, it's got to be negative k times um, c i plus d. Remember, you remember this f tilde, the way we made this automorphic function, c i plus d to the negative k. So I get a c i plus d to the negative k. Let's think about what that is. Um, if I have a y k theta, whatever that is, and then I have a 1 x 0 1, I claim that it doesn't change. The CD, whatever the CD is, the CD does not depend on X. I don't even have to work out what it is. The X will only change the top row, but not the bottom row. Okay. Right. So this is yeah. so this is something. I don't care what it is in Y's and thetas to the K, whatever, to the minus K, whatever it is y to the s, I don't care about y to the s. The dx integral, I can bring all the way inside. And this is an integral. This integral is uh, an integral 0, 1. dy over y squared, d theta, integral over y, integral over theta. What's this? Is that the Fourier coefficient? Which one? Uh, the zeroth. It's the zeroth Fourier coefficient. This is a general fact. When you have, when you take the inner product of a form with the Eisenstein series, it picks off the zeroth Fourier coefficient of that form. But f was a. It's a cusp form. It's a cusp form. So this is just zero. Why is n mod gamma infinity like integrating from zero to one? Ah, um, n is the full, uh, n oh, is this. Oh, oh, of course, of course, of course. OK, I see. And gamma infinity is the integer subgroup. So this is exactly picking off the zeroth coefficient, which is 0. And that's true for any n, for any s, rather, true for any s. So when I take the residue, this, uh, so the total mass, this is, a, this is a, a general, this is an important fact. Uh, the total mass of a, of a modular form is zero of a cusp form. It exactly averages to zero. Okay. So this implies that the integral of the MOS form itself, the modular form, whatever, the automorphized modular form is, is zero. And so mixing, when you have things of mean zero, mixing really is decay. So, so these things are zero. The inner product with one is, of course, just the, the total, total mass of the thing itself. This thing is zero. OK, so let's go all the way back. 
Uh, gosh, how far back can I go? Let me grab all of this. No, that's not good. Let me grab all of this. That's better. Uh oh. There we go. And paste. Okay. So, what's our upshot? We had AF of N squared is bounded by this whole thing plus this big O. This whole thing, um, let me replace it, all of this with all of this. Um, that's a slick way of doing this. Uh, not that slick. Okay. Um, I get this one over, I want to put all of this in here. That's what I want. Let me make it a little smaller. I love technology. This is just crazy. You could never do this on a blackboard. Huh? And I don't need any of this. 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 Okay. So far, so good. So we're almost there. Um, so this is where we were. So this whole thing is bounded by, I have my n to the k. Um, here, the L2 norm is a constant and there's some, uh, some over j, so I get my one over j plus j times a sum d going from one to j of this coefficient, this matrix coefficient. And we just said that the matrix coefficient is bounded by uh, d to the minus eta. These at least one, I don't need the one plus d to the minus eta. So here I get d to the minus eta. And then this other error, j to the a, n to the k minus eta. And now we're done. Because this. So the, the two eta's might be different, right? The two eta's might be different. Yeah, take the worst one of the two. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now we're done. This is j to the one minus eta. I'm, I'm summing, I'm compared to the integral. And here's my j squared. Oh, I lost the factor of one over j squared. There's a factor of one over j squared that moves into here. J trivial bound on the on this was was J. And so I have J to the two minus eta times one over J squared. So this whole thing is uh, N to the K. The one over J is gonna be much better than uh, J to the minus eta. So this is N to the power K with a little bit of J savings. And then this is J to a large power with a little bit of N savings. Choose J to be some power of N, and you get N to the K minus some little power and take square roots. It's very pretty. It's very pretty. Yeah. It's very um uh I want I want to make just one remark. We're using these two equidistributions against each other. One and either one by itself doesn't get you very much. Just the low-lying Horus cycle equidistribution doesn't get you very much. Just the decay of matrix coefficients by itself doesn't get you very much, but they're different kinds of uh, dynamical systems, each of which is equidistributing and mixing. Um, so uh, the remark is that- this So is one of them is um, Horus cycle flow, and one of them is- um, it's like geodesic, geodesic flow, flow of a horror right? cycle piece. Yeah, so it's geodesic and horror cycle? Yes, but there, one is pushing a one-dimensional uh -huh. uh, closed horror cycle down, 
Mm -hmm. And the other one is taking a, a three-dimensional integral, if you like, mm -hmm. but moving one of the variables by the group action. Right. So they're really quite different. So uh -huh. uh, equidistribution of Horace cycle flow, this black box one, and black box two is the mixing. Uh, equidistribution of long closed Horace cycles, long closed Horace cycles, and mixing of Horace cycle flow are different actions, are, are different uh, types of, uh, you know, dynamical systems, dynamical systems, each of them mixing and playing them against each other, playing them against each other has this profound consequence, uh, gives applications. And as I said, uh, Akshay and, and co-authors with Michelle and then with uh, Lyndon Strauss and um, Einsiedler went on to do all kinds of uh, great things in, in higher rank and so on. Uh, but th there's a fundamental, there's this, I just want to end with this Furstenberg uh, times two times three uh, conjecture, which let me just say it in words. Uh, if, you have a, if you have a map on the circle, so this is the, the one torus, R mod Z, if you have a map, if you have a if you have a measure on the on the two torus that's inv invariant under multiplication by two, well that can be just about anything. That's like uh, there's uncountably measure many measures that are invariant under multi multiplication by two. Uh, the same thing is true with multiplication by three. But the conjecture is that if you are invariant under multiplication by two and multiplication by three, then you're Haar measure. So any uh, well you may as well take it to be ergodic. Ergodic measure. This is open still? This is wide open, hmm. invariant, under. Um, if you allow not just ergodic, but positive entropy. So entropy plays a, a really important role here. But uh, again, I'm, I'm out of time and uh, in all kinds of ways. Uh, any ergodic measure invariant under both uh, of these dynamical systems, which shouldn't know about each other. Multiplication by two and multiplication by three is supposed to be, uh, right? This is, I mean, Kolatz is, is all about this under both multiplication by two and multiplication by three uh, is, is unique, is unique, uh, is, is uh, har. I guess I should say the only, the only measure and hence the only ergodic measure, but you can assume things are, are ergodic, um, is, is just a par measure on the circle. So that's sort of the philosophy this is the philosophy for why playing these two dynamical systems against each other can uh, should result in, in some gain. And one of the big open problems in trying to use this in higher uh, rank, we have matrix coefficients decay, no problem. Um, the analog of black box one, this low-lying horror cycle. Well, whatever, whatever this is in the limit as y goes to infinity, the limiting uh, measure has to be something invariant under the unipotent flow. So in higher rank, we have Ratner's theorems that tell us uh, invariance, but we don't have rates. The proofs of Ratner's theorems say there is some uh, limiting measure, which is going to be uh, algebraic, but we don't know the rate at which we approach that algebraic. Uh, uh, so let me put here. So this would uh, give like ineffective um, subconvexity or something? Well, it doesn't give subconvexity because subconvexity means a power gain. Okay, so it's, it just says something like your little o of the convex bound or something? If or you can even? push that, yeah, if you can push that through. Okay, I see. Yeah, so need... Because uh, I guess you also have a loss in the j variable, right? Exactly. So, okay, yeah. Need effective Ratner uh, for applications in higher rank. Can't do it with three derivatives? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe four. Higher rank. Okay, so this is a big sort of industry and, and open problem and uh, where some of these things have gotten stuck. All right. Thank you for sticking with me all semester long.